from Galatians 1, 1 through 9. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and the God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who, who are with me. To the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is one is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. When, uh, when, when this whole COVID-19 season first began, uh, I have to say that to, to come here and to be in an empty, relatively empty room and to, uh, to be instructed to speak to the camera because I'm speaking to the people on the live stream, um, I was rattled. It was very unsettling. It was very uncomfortable and it felt very unnatural. This is a little rattling. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's uh, you know, we, we've kind of gotten accustomed to being in an empty room and me just speaking to the camera, and I don't really have to wonder where I'm going to look. And, um, but it is so good to see you all. We're so glad that you're here. We're glad that the door seems to be opening for us to begin to move gradually toward uh, a sense of normalness, whatever that means, right? Whatever normal is. But... Um, so welcome. We're so glad you're here, and we're beginning this series, as, uh, as Chip and others have alluded. Uh, it'll take us through the summer. If we, if we stay on course the way we've kind of plotted things out, uh, it'll take us all the way through the first Sunday in September. So it'll be 13 weeks in this book of the New Testament, Galatians. Galatians is a very powerful book. Uh, it, it protects the gospel in a very almost aggressive way, as we're even going to see here today. But I think also in doing so, Paul brings a tremendous clarity to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I hope that as we spend this time together, that our grasp of the gospel will not only become more and more clear, but that our trust in Christ will also become deeper and deeper, and that we would respond uh, and be changed by loving him and, and desiring to serve him more and more. The Apostle Paul was a missionary. He traveled uh, throughout the known world, and he would preach the gospel wherever he went. And in many cases, there were churches that were established in the, the towns and cities where Paul ministered. And it was a time when there was no internet, there was no email, there were no telephones, and so the way that Paul stayed in contact with his sons and daughters in the Lord, if you will, was by writing letters to them. Uh, the Greek word for letters is epistle, so you'll, you'll often hear uh, books in the New Testament that were written by Paul, and, and Galatians in particular, referred to as an epistle from Paul to, to various churches. Paul's letter to the Galatians is not just a letter to one church. Galatia was kind of a region, uh, and it was an area where Paul had ministered in a number of towns, and there were churches in, in a lot of those towns that were established. And so when Paul writes this letter, he's not just writing to one church, he's writing to sort of a family of churches. If you think of it this way, it's sort of like our EP family of churches. They were in many ways like-minded. They had kind of the same DNA spiritually and theologically, if you will, because they all were started uh, by and through Paul. Um, I'm sure that there were relational connections between these congregations, particularly within the leadership of these churches. 
So Paul is writing to the churches in Galatia, and, and I think he is, his hope is that this letter will be distributed and shared throughout all of the churches, not just to one or two of them. What I'd like to do today, very briefly, is to, to look at three things, three particular aspects surrounding this letter. I want us to look at the occasion for the letter. I want to look a little bit at the author of the letter and then look just a little bit at the subject matter of the letter. So we'll look at the occasion, the author, and the subject matter. The occasion is, is really the why. Why was Paul writing? And if you're familiar with, with Paul's letters, you know that, that there's sort of a formulaic beginning of all of Paul's letters that he writes to, to the people that he, that, to whom he's writing. He, he typically will, will begin by uh, saying who he is, and he'll also communicate if there are other people writing with him, and so it'll say either the Apostle Paul or Paul along with Timothy and Silas, things like that, and then he'll address the people to whom he's writing, um, and then he will typically um, deliver some type of a, of a doxology, some type of a blessing, a greeting, uh, it'll, it'll sound like, you know, may the Lord bless you, or greetings, grace and peace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Sometimes he'll even uh, go into praising the, the church or the people that he's writing to because of what he's hearing about their faith, or what he's hearing about their ministry, or the fact that their reputation is spreading throughout the church in many, many places, that, that it's resulting in praise being given to God for, for their lives. So just uh, let me give you one example here that kind of somewhat encapsulates this pretty well. In Ephesians, Paul begins like this. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So you can kind of get the feel. It's a very warm greeting. It's a very affirming greeting. Uh, it's very similar when, when you look at the book of Ephesians. I mean, I'm sorry, at, at Philippians. Philippians is a very similar greeting. And then he'll, he'll launch into praising the Philippians for the things that are going on in their lives and the things that he's heard that God is doing in their midst. When Paul writes to the church in Rome, the book of Romans, very similar kind of a warm greeting. Paul, an apostle, greetings to you, grace and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus and all these wonderful things I'm hearing about you. But then we come to the book of Galatians. And Galatians kind of starts very similar. He says, Paul, an apostle, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of, of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, so far, so good, right? So far, pretty warm, pretty affirming. And then you come to verse 6. And in verse 6, he says, what in the world is wrong with you people? Now, that's not literally what he says, but it's basically what he says, because this is what he says. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, or it's really no gospel at all. There are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And as Chip said, even if we or an angel from heaven were to preach to you a gospel that is contrary to the one that we preached to you originally, may they be condemned. Paul is angry. He's, he's partly angry with the Galatians. But he's really angry with some so-called teachers who have come into their midst and begun to teach them things that are different from the gospel that Paul has taught them. And they 
are receiving it. They're embracing it. They're believing it. We're going to learn more as we go along in our, in our study of Galatians about this teaching as we go along. But for now, let me, let me just bring out a couple of points for us that we see in Paul's greeting and introduction here. For one thing, what they are receiving and believing from these so-called teachers is a different gospel. It is in conflict with the gospel that Paul has taught them. In fact, Paul, Paul really does go on to say, it is no gospel at all. Second, Paul says that to believe this teaching is in effect to desert the one that called them into God's grace. Now, we might look at this and, and think, well, well, perhaps Paul could mean that they are deserting him because he, in preaching the gospel to them, is the one that called them into the grace of Christ. But if, you, if you've read much of Paul's writings in, in the other letters that he's written, you know that in Paul's theology, the one who calls us into God's grace is whom? It's God himself. So I think in reality, Paul is saying that by believing this message, you are deserting the one who saved you, God himself. Thirdly, Paul is so concerned about the harm and the damage that is being done in this, with this teaching in the lives of God's people and in, and in the ministries and lives of the churches that he says, let anyone who is preaching a message that is in conflict with the gospel that we preach, let them be condemned. This is a big deal. This letter is a big deal in the history of the church. Paul is not just writing to catch up on, on gossip. He's not just writing to stay in touch. He is very passionately engaging a circumstance that's going on in the churches in Galatia. And so I think it's very important for us to pay attention to what he has to say because I think in many ways, if, if, if what he's saying doesn't apply directly to us, we certainly can benefit from the clarity that Paul is going to bring to the gospel for us as well. So that's the occasion. The author, we all know, is the Apostle Paul. But, but I don't just want to remind you of who wrote it. There, there are a couple of things that Paul says here about himself that I think are important for us to take into consideration as we read it. Listen to how he presents his credentials to the churches in Galatia. He says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Paul is an apostle. The word apostle means one who is sent. So Paul's life is not random. He has been sent. He's on a mission. There are quite a few people in the Bible that are called apostles, actually. We obviously have the disciples, the disciples who were with Jesus and were commissioned by Jesus. We refer to them as apostles. But there are other people in the New Testament that are also referred to as apostles. For example, Barnabas and John Mark are sent. And so they are often referred to as apostles. But they were sent into ministry by the church. Right? They, were, they were sent and commissioned into ministry by people. Now, by the way, this is how pastors and leaders in the church today are commissioned. There's, we, we talk about it in, in terms of an internal call and an external call. The internal call is, is what we're talking about when you hear somebody say, you know what, I feel like God is calling me to do such and such. There, that's an expression of an internal sense of calling. I feel like God might be calling me to do this. I feel like God is calling me to be a pastor or to be a doctor or to be a builder or, you know, whatever it is. I feel like God is calling me to do this. Well, that's, that's the internal call. But what we, what we look at, particularly in the area of ministry, is we, we look for a sense that there are other people 
in the church who would concur with that sense of call. So I don't just discern God's call on my life in a vacuum. I say, I think that God might be calling me to this ministry, and then we have a process in place by which we then come to others and say, would you help me discern this call, that we would do it together? I don't want to just be you know, going off in a closet, figuring things out by myself, but do you think that I have the gifts that, that would accompany such a call? Do you think that it, that it would appear to you that God would be calling me to this? We, we talk about that in terms of an external call. So the internal call we, we, we look for an affirmation or a confirmation through the external call with others. And so this, this way of being called and commissioned by people is not a bad thing. I think it's really the only way that God is, is calling people into ministry today. But Paul's sentness was not like that. Paul's sentness did not come through the commissioning of men. Paul's sentness came directly from the Lord Himself. In Acts chapter 9, we know that there was an event in Paul's life where Paul had a firsthand encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will see more next week, particularly, how Paul's preparation for his apostolic ministry came directly from Jesus just as did the preparation of the other capital A apostles, as we might refer to them. And so the reason that this is important, the reason that this is relevant for this letter, is it appears that in addition to teaching a different gospel, it appears that these so-called teachers have also been seeking to call into question Paul's apostleship seeking somehow to discredit his calling and his ministry by calling into question the, the authenticity of his capital A apostleship. Perhaps he's, he's not truly an insider. You know, he doesn't really know Peter and James and John. He's not really of them. You could, you could see how, how that might take place. And so P Paul is responding to that. Then we come to the subject matter, the what of the letter. And we're not going to obviously unpack the whole letter in one week, otherwise we wouldn't need the other 12 weeks. But um, Paul does come right out of the gate preaching, probably more so than in, in most of the, the introductory letters that, you know, that, that, that preamble section of the letters that he writes. In verse 3, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who, up to that point, that sounds like every other letter, but this is something that's unique to Galatians, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. And so very quickly, I just want to point out four things. Our need, Jesus' act, God's pleasure, and our hope. Our need, Jesus' act, God's pleasure and our hope. Our need, we see when Paul says, Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us, to rescue us. Jesus did not come into the world to help us. Now, did he help us? Of course he did. But that's not why he came. He didn't come into the world even to teach us, even though he did teach us. But Paul is saying that Jesus did not come to improve us, to teach us. He came to rescue us. He came to deliver us. He came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And we're going to hear more about this as, as we go along. Then we come to Jesus' act. Paul says that Jesus gave himself for our sins. And then back in verse 1, he said, and he was raised from the dead. The way that Jesus has rescued us, the way that he has delivered us, is by dying for us. Paying for, atoning for our sins. You may remember uh, a month or so, maybe even a little bit longer than a month or so ago, we were talking about forgiveness. And one of the, the things that I said was that any time 
harm is done, anytime damage has been done, anytime there's an offense and forgiveness is going to be offered, someone has to pay. Now, if you, if you break my window with your baseball and I am going to forgive you, that means that I'm no longer going to make you pay. But if I don't make you pay, that means that in some shape, some way, I'm going to pay. I'm either going to pay by living with a broken window, right? And in January, trust me, I'll pay, <laughs> right? Or I can fix it myself, but if I'm not making you pay, then who's going to pay for that repair? I am. Well, you see, our sins have ruined our relationship with the God who made us. And if God were to make us pay, then we would be spiritually dead and spiritually condemned for all eternity because that's what sin has done. But God is the God of love, and He offers us forgiveness. Well, how can He do that? Well, rather than making us pay, God paid. God in the flesh came into our world, and He paid. He died in our place. Third is God's pleasure. Paul says, all of this happened according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever. This was God's good pleasure. If you, if you think about it, we, we did not come to Him saying, um, uh, Lord, can we, can, we, can we negotiate something here? You know, I know that we sin, that I know that, that, the, that the payment for sin is death, and we, and, and, you know, but can, maybe we can work something out. Maybe you could overlook a few parts of this. Maybe we could figure out a way that you could, um, you know, compromise your standards a little bit. No. That's not the way this happened. You know, we, see, in our relationships, we usually negotiate the terms first, and then we enter in, right? We say, well, how much is it going to cost? Who's going to pay? What's going to be the form of payment? And once we get an agreement, then we enter in to relationships. But in this case, God just made a payment. He just paid it. No negotiating. And we might say, well, wait, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm, I mean, we, I, 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 I didn't contribute anything. And God says, that's right. Actually, you had nothing you could contribute. Yeah, but I, I didn't, I mean, I, I, can't even, I can't even pay you back. That's right, you can't. We can accept it, but you see, God just entered in. He loved us so much that He just entered in, made the payment. He restored the relationship. It's done. It was His idea. It's His plan. It's His will to God be the glory, Paul says. And then we come to our hope, and our hope is the fact that we have been delivered from this present evil age, he says. We have seen the brokenness of this, of this life, have we not? Are you paying attention? The brokenness of this present evil age is all around us. We see it in the, the social injustices. We see it in the racial, the, the need of ra racial reconciliation. We see it in the racial injustice. We see it in the rioting and the looting and the arson and the destruction of people's property. We see it in this COVID-19 virus. This is part of the brokenness of this present evil age. Now listen, this, this is important. And I, I wonder if, if God isn't, you know, giving us, you know, a heavy dose of the brokenness of this present evil age for, for some purpose to wake us up and help us to see our need. But, it, but how we respond is a part of, of how Paul is saying we have been set free from this present evil age. I think, I think part of the way we've been set free from this present evil age is that we have a hope beyond this present evil age. This world is not all there is. Christ has come, and He has secured for us an inheritance that is eternal. Jesus is going to come back, and He's going to bring about the renewal of all things. We have hope beyond this life, beyond this world. 
So I think that's one aspect that Paul has in mind when he says, we have been delivered from this present evil age. But I, but I think there's also implications for how we live even right now in the midst of this present evil age. How do we live as people who are delivered from this present evil age and yet still exist in it? That's harder for me. That's the area where I feel like I got more work to do here. I got, I got to figure this out better. Because, and I'll just kind of give you a, a little a couple blurbs here of, of where I am as I'm processing all of this. But I think it's important that as followers of Christ, that we speak up and say that black lives really do matter. All black lives really do matter. And the reason it's so important for us to be able to say that is because we as Americans have lived in a place where for hundreds of years we have said that all people are equal. Well, guess what? Not everybody's as equal as others. We have people in our country, we have people in the church who don't feel equal because they're not treated equal. And that's wrong. That's unjust. It's unbiblical. So we need to be able to say that all black lives matter. I think we also need to be able to say that this rioting and this looting and this destruction of people's property and livelihoods and their businesses, that's also wrong. I think it's a little easier for us to, to recognize, you know, COVID-19. We're all in agreement. That's wrong. <laughs> you know, we want to be free of that. We, we, don't, we don't, you know, and, and I think it's important that we are graciously caring for one another in the midst of this. But think about this for a minute. I think that on both ends of, of the continuum, of the spectrum of the political world right now, do you know what both ends of the spectrum are putting their hope in? They're putting their hope in law. On one end, you've got people who are saying, we need law and order. We need law. Law's the answer. I got news for you. As a follower of Christ and a preacher of the gospel, law's not the answer. And then you go on the other end of the continuum, and you think, well, those, these people are anti-law. No, they're not. They're, they're putting their hope in law, too. They just want different laws. They want to get rid of the police so that they can have different police that follow a different set of laws. You see, their hope is still in law. They just want a different law. In both, in both cases, their hope is in the law. Now, you say, well, well, at least the people who want law and order seem to be a little bit more on the godly side, and they're putting their hope in God's law. Now, think about that for a minute, and think about the Apostle Paul. You know what Paul is going to say in this book? He's going to say much the same thing that he says in other places, like the book of Romans and what the writer of Hebrews says. You know what they say? The law can't save you. The law can't rescue you. The law can show you how horrible you are. The law can be a mirror, and we can hold it up to you, and you can see how, what, you know, what's all wrong with you. But the law can't fix you, and the law certainly can't save you. And if the law of God can't save us, <laughs> then the law of man sure as heck can't save us. You see? I think, I think Paul bring, and I, I think that we're going to hear this, and, and you're going to probably feel like you're getting beat, beat about the head with it before we're all done here, but Paul is going to be arguing, culminating all in Galatians 2.20, he's going to say, I've, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's not the law that will save us, not even God's law. What we need is the gospel of God's grace, that Jesus saw our need, that we could not do it ourselves, and he came, and he did what we could not do for ourselves. He died. He paid. And we have been delivered from this present evil age. And now we've got to figure out, what does that look like? That's what's in this book. I hope that you'll stick with us. 
and I hope that you will find the grace of God to be more glorious than you ever did before. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have not seen our need and then sent a list of laws. You sent your son, and he paid it all. All to him we owe. Thank you for your grace. We pray that in these weeks to come, that you will give us eyes to see more and more clearly how glorious your grace is, how free it is, and how it is truly your grace that saves us and nothing else. That we would respond by loving you, by, by glorying in you, and desiring to live for you. Would you come by your spirit and teach us and work in us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.